And welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Code Lab. Uh, this is, of course, the show where we make and create with Tinker Code. Uh, and I am uh, really excited um, to this is number day number two of Code Lab and day number two of Hour of Code. Um, this is the show that helps students and teachers make and create with Tinker Code. And we're excited because today is the, the uh, not only the second day, but we have two amazing guests we're gonna bring uh, to the show today that are gonna help us walk through this Tinker project, um, which is called Search and Scan the Lunar Landscape. Uh, now there are literally thousands of kids watching from all around the globe right now. We have so much to look forward to uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes. It's very exciting. Uh, so we're glad you could join us today. Uh, but let me go ahead and, um, uh, share with you my screen here so we can introduce our guests and show you how to get started uh, today with uh, Code Lab. So here we go. There we go. All right, my friends. So in just a few minutes, we are going to be visited by these awesome aerospace engineers. Okay, this is important because they're uh, a big part of the Artemis program, the Artemis mission that's happening, uh, which is gonna be doing some great things very soon. They're gonna update us on all of that. Uh, and then we're gonna be going through this project. Uh, this is uh, Search and Scan, the Lunar Landscape. Uh, and uh, our education support coach is going to be helping us build this project so that you guys can all uh, add your own custom mods and modifications to this. Uh, it's a real fun project. You can design your lunar landscape. Uh, but we're also going to be looking into the science behind what would you want your rover to look for when you're on uh, the moon, when you're on the lunar landscape. So um, we'd be looking for rocks and ice and things like that. But uh, our, our aerospace engineers are going to show us uh, exactly what the science is we should be thinking about when we do that project. Now, don't forget you also uh, can earn this amazing badge. I wanna make sure you guys all do that for any project that you complete, uh, the NASA projects on Tinker, uh, you can um, earn this awesome badge. So you're gonna wanna get that. Uh, it's got the NASA logo on that, uh, um, on that astronaut right there. It's got your name on it. So uh, there's also badges you can earn by doing the uh, Hour of Code. So you're definitely gonna wanna do as much as you can during Hour of Code uh, on Tinker. So you are also going to be able to ask questions of our NASA guests. So I'm gonna put this QR code up here. You can grab your, uh, if you have a mobile device or use that link, go tinker slash code lab Q. Uh, that way you can ask questions while we're doing the show. We're going to harvest your questions and put them uh, on the air. We'll maybe give you a nod to your school or your city, uh, wherever you're at. Uh, but this is a fun time to ask some really good questions of NASA aerospace engineers. Keep that in mind. Uh, so if you have questions about astronauts and rockets and things like that, uh, you're going to want to uh, really... Uh, uh, up your science game here for, for those. So who am I? Uh, I'm Mr. Rizak. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the senior lead here uh, at Tinker, former STEM and science teacher, uh, tech coach and tech director. So uh, I, I'm, I worked with students for, for many years and uh, to help them integrate uh, STEM and, and technology in, in schools and very excited to, uh, to be with you today. Um, if you are in the kind of, uh, if, if, you're, if your teachers are in the tweet, um, uh, in the mood to tweet or share, you can use this QR code and this link to send out a little tweet, tweet and add your your other uh, educator colleagues to um, to this show, and uh, they can also do this with their students. We have many more events happening this week, so uh, if you want to share that out, uh, go for it. Uh, so today uh, we are going to be doing search and scan. Uh, this is uh, one of our uh, eleven NASA um, uh, Hour of Code lessons, uh, and this is kind of our like mini agenda here. So we're going to be doing search and scan. We're going to get to know our guests a little bit. Uh, we're going to understand our project. They're going to walk us through kind of the science behind the lunar landscape and what we're going to be doing uh, with Artemis uh, on the moon. And then um, we're going to create and then we have some questions. So that's how it's going to go. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through. I want to make sure you know how to get to the project. Uh, so we're going to get you started. Uh, by um, uh, getting you to the first page, right? Tinker.com. If you want to know how to get to this project, uh, you can do it a couple ways. You're going to go to uh, Tinker.com uh, and 
if you have are part of a class, uh, you can log in as a student uh, either uh, um, right there, and you can do that either with Google or you can do it with your username or password, uh, or you can use the Smart Pass. Uh, so you're going to get into Tinker. All right. Hopefully you have a classroom. Go to your classes because we've embedded all these projects directly in your classes. Uh, right there, you can go to the NASA Hour of Code. That's where we put all of our NASA projects. Uh, and then you can find the search and scan project right there and, uh, and dig right in. There's one other way to get to this project. If you are not part of a classroom, you could just go to NASA or tinker.com slash NASA and then click on the search and scan project right there and just kind of uh, dig in and, and have some fun. So, uh, so that will bring us to uh, our very special guests. See, we were already there, uh, ready to introduce our, our guests. So um, the first person I'd like to bring on uh, for you today is, uh, is and where are we there? Right there, uh, is uh, aerospace engineer Emily Judd. Now, Emily uh, is uh, an aerospace engineer at the NASA Langley Research Center. She focuses on human exploration from Mars. Uh, she went to University of Michigan, studied space engineering, climate and space science and uh, sciences and engineering. Uh, and then um, uh, also uh, she studies music and or studied music and orchestra and still uh, participates in music, which is great. So uh, everybody welcome. Um, Emily Judd to Code Lab. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today to talk with you more about human exploration on the moon. Well, welcome, Emily. I'm sure right now everybody in their classroom is just, uh, you know, shouting and clapping. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have one other guest we're going to introduce here, too. We can get uh, um, uh, Dr. Owens here. Uh, on the show. And um, Andrew Owens uh, is also an aerospace engineer. Um, and he is, I believe, also at Langley, but he, he focuses on space mission analysis. And uh, um, I think he works on logistics and risk. And that's important because I know, at least in America, in the world, we're having all these logistics problems. So maybe, uh, you know, I'm sure he has uh, maybe something to say about that. Um, but he helps determine what supplies people need and the spacecraft to make sure astronauts have everything they need for a trip to the uh, moon or the Mars. Uh, and so he went to MIT, studied um, space systems engineering. Uh, so everybody, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Owens. Hi, everyone. It, it's, correct to the to, today. It's, for, it's correct for me to say you're a doctor. Is that right? Or, <laughs> uh, sure, but not not the medical kind. But okay, spent a All lot right. of time in grad school. You're a space doctor. Now that's that's even <laughs> cooler, I think. Don't you think? Um, <laughs> well, welcome both of you. And um, I just kind of had uh, uh, one kind of like kind of kickoff question for you both because you're both you know you know the 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 big Artemis uh, program is kind of about to have something really special happen soon. And I'm not sure what, maybe uh, I won't tell everybody what that is. Maybe I can let you guys uh, tell us what that is. And then how have you been, you know, what have you been up to in the last few months in, in the lead up to, um, to this amazing uh, event? Uh, Emily, do you want to start with us? Uh, sure. So I think what you're alluding to here is the, the Artemis One launch that's coming up next, early next year. Um, and so this will be the first launch of NASA's newest rocket, the Space Launch System, or SLS for short. Um, we'll also be uh, putting the Orion crew capsule on top of the SLS, um, and that's the vehicle that the astronauts will actually uh, live in for their lunar missions on, you know, on the way to, to the moon. Um, so this mission, since it is more of a test mission, won't have astronauts on board, uh, but they are actually going to include test dummies to kind of do some experiments while the, the rocket goes up and while Orion goes around the moon as part of this, this test. Andrew, anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a very exciting time getting, look, looking at getting ready to send humans back to the moon. Um, for the first time in a very long time, not since the uh, since the early 70s. So we've got a new rocket, a new spacecraft, and like Emily said, this is you know the test flight. Make sure everything uh, is working right. Make sure we're we're uh, you know doing everything safely for the uh, crew of astronauts that'll go then on Artemis 2 mission later on. So Emily, what have you been doing, kind of in up running up to the last few months? I have to imagine. 
uh, things have been getting a little crazy and making sure everybody's double checking and you know stuff. Uh, what, what have you been up to? So I actually work on the Mars architecture team. So what we've been doing um, as part of you know integrating with the Artemis program is we're looking at how can we test the technology on the moon in order to prepare for a future mission to send astronauts to Mars. So, you know, I haven't been so down in with all the details of, you know, especially Artemis 1, since crew aren't involved, but we're definitely looking at the technologies and the different types of vehicles that are being developed for lunar exploration and trying to figure out ways that we can use that same technology um, for Mars. See, I, I mute myself once and I, I forget to unmute myself. There you go. Uh, Andrew, uh, and how about you? What is your uh, what is your role right now? And how is that, uh, um, how's that going in the run-up to, to this launch? Yeah, so similar to Emily, we're both in the space mission analysis branch and we really look at um, you know, mission planning and campaign planning for human exploration for the moon and for Mars. Um, and like Emily said, we're looking, these are these are really connected things as we're trying to, we're learning to to send humans farther out into the solar system to live and work in space and expand our boundaries. So my uh, personal area of expertise is looking, like you said, at logistics and risk and basically determining what exactly do the astronauts need to carry with them, whether it's food, oxygen, water, how much, and also things like spare parts to keep the systems going, tools so they can do maintenance on their spacecraft, um, and how to carry all those things as efficiently as possible because it's hard to get into space. It's hard to move around in space. It's, um, you know, we have, like you mentioned, the supply chain issues here, and that's on ships that can just sort of sail back and forth across the ocean. Uh, rockets, even harder to get up into low Earth orbit, harder to get to the moon. So we're trying to find the most efficient ways to be able to carry all the things that we need to make sure we have a safe and effective mission. And that's mainly what I study is optimizing that logistics plan. All right. Well, we have a kind of a, a question to ask of you that could help kind of guide uh, our, our discussion into um, into our project. Uh, and that question is, what do we hope to learn from this Artemis mission uh, and then studying the moon uh, going forward? And I believe you have uh, you have some visuals you'd like to, to share here. So let me get those going. So what do we want to learn uh, from what are we going to learn from studying the moon, basically? Yeah, so I think first of all, we'll, we'll start off with a little explanation of what Artemis is. So uh, next slide, please. Sure. And so the first time that, that NASA and humanity as a whole went to the moon was part of the Apollo program, as, as Andrew mentioned earlier. And so as we're getting ready to go back to the moon, we're, we're also looking back at our history of lunar exploration. And if you know a little bit about Greek mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And this time as we go to explore, we're going to be sending the first woman to the moon along with the first person of color. So we're really expanding who all is involved with lunar exploration and space as a whole. Um, so that's really exciting to be involved with a, a new program that's, that's really getting everyone involved in space exploration. So next slide, please. So, as we mentioned, Artemis is going to be, you know, lunar exploration, but also looking forward to, to Mars exploration and other deep space uh, destinations. This means we are using a lot of different vehicles um, in order to make this all happen. So we talked a little bit earlier about our, our new rocket, the space launch system that's coming up, and the Orion spacecraft that the astronauts will be using for their crew capsule. And so that will get you to the moon. Then the human landing system will take you down to the surface of the moon and then back up to meet with Orion on your way back home. We'll also have uh, you know, new space suits that'll be used for lunar exploration, um, new rovers, both uh, unpressurized, so kind of like a golf cart that you would drive around, um, and also pressurized rovers that would be more of like a, a, a a van or a camper type of thing where you can live in there for a couple days, but it's you know not not really very big. Um, we'll also have uh, the gateway, which is kind of like a little bit of a depot around the moon where some of the astronauts might stay there in lunar orbit to do experiments, but it will also be um, able to have robotic experiments going on when crew is not there. 
Then we'll also have our um, ground systems, such as the exploration ground systems at the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, down in Florida. So that's where the launches will take place. And then we have our communications. So you see the big antennas there uh, to be able to communicate with the astronauts and the vehicles as they're traveling through space. Wow. So next slide. And we do have a, we have a project about telling your lunar gateway story. So uh, we have a separate project because we can go do that after, uh, after this one today. Yeah. Okay. Um, so science, the, the big question, why are we going back to the moon? Um, so when the Apollo astronauts went, they mostly went around what we could call the equator, kind of the middle areas of mm -hmm. the moon. And so Artemis will be going back to, will be going down to the South Pole of the moon. So a different area, new places to explore. Um, and some of the main science goals are understanding just more about how planets work, how different you know, bodies in the solar system came to be, um, what they're made out of, uh, you know, how the earth and moon interact within their system. Um, since the moon does not have an atmosphere, we can also learn more about the sun from the effects that the solar radiation has on the lunar soil. Um, we can also use this for astronomy purposes, positioning um, you know, telescopes and things like that on the far side of the moon, where it'll be a lot quieter because um, the moon will block all of the radio waves coming off of the earth. Um, you know, doing more experimental science and uh, getting the astronauts a lot of practice on how to do these types of exploration tasks so that when we go to Mars, um, they'll be prepared. Nice. I'll hand it off to Andrew now. Yep, so like Emily said, this is all one big connected um, human spaceflight effort. And one of the big elements of the tech of the Artemis missions is really that is the technology in addition to the science. So we want to work with partners in industry, partners internationally, uh, academia partners in, in universities to develop and demonstrate and test new technologies and new capabilities on the lunar surface that will help us then for uh, working on Mars and, and getting to and from Mars safely. So there's a couple of them listed here. Um, one of my favorites, in-situ resource utilization or ISRU. And that's really using technology that can take some resource that's already in space, like uh, water on the moon, if there's ice in the permanently shaded craters, then we don't have mm -hmm. to carry water with us. Um, again, linking back to logistics. So ISRU can help us use that water and, and be able to get it, store it, process it so that it's safe to drink or safe to use for other purposes. Um, and that'll be very important for getting humans out further into the solar system. We've also got things like power technologies, you know, having, whether it's solar power or nuclear power um, in space to get this, get to, to help all these systems keep running. Um, dust mitigation is gonna be very important because, you know, the moon is a dusty surface and it can really, um, you know, get into the gears and get into mm -hmm. all the seals and things and could become a problem. So we wanna make sure we know how to deal with it. And then, of course, there's other things like um, moving through the extreme environments on the moon, moving through extreme locations, um, you know, whether we're going into deep craters or craters with, with steep sides, we want to be sure we can get in and out of them safely. Um, and then finally, looking at sort of a more sustained uh, presence, um, there's sort of excavation, construction, um, what I hear people call civil engineering on the moon, where now it's not just you land in a spacecraft and you live out of the spacecraft, but we're really building you know, a base, a place where we can have a sustained human presence on the moon to explore uh, the area around. So if you go to the next slide. Oops, um, there you go. We, we call it the Artemis Base Camp. And you can see sort of a starting point here where you've got the lander in the background there. There's a pressurized rover, the sort of uh, RV camper that, that uh, Emily mentioned uh, with a couple astronauts in front of it. And then a smaller rover, it's more like a, more like an ATV that you can get around faster, but you have to be wearing your suit. Um, and so this would be sort of the, the starting point, a seed of having a sustained human presence on the moon to do all that lunar science, to develop all of that technology and demonstrate it in a safer environment where you know we're a little closer to home than Mars, for example, and really uh, just gain more experience in human exploration uh, out in the solar system. Um, here's a, if you want here's to learn a, more, I think- I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I had a silly little question. Maybe there's a quick answer, but, you know, uh, as our students are designing, you know, their rovers and things like that, is there additional risk for like adding an extra window in any, in any device? Are windows, 
additional, you know, is there some math uh, algorithm that says, you know, we can't add any more windows than, than this. I was curious about that. So there, there's, a lot, a, of, there's a, a lot of trade-offs. Uh, you can go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Emily, go oh, for yeah, it. I was, <laughs> I was say, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of trade-offs that go into designing um, something like that because you, you could also look at it. It's not just do I have another window or not. It's do I have one big window or lots of little windows? Do I have um, curved windows or flat windows? How are the seals around those windows done? And one thing that we we're always looking at is mass because all of this stuff is going to have to be launched and then we're going to have to land it on the lunar surface and all that launching and landing and moving around in space takes a lot of propellant. So there's, um, and which I think Emily was about to, to mention was the structural implications of having a window versus say just an aluminum wall, which might be able to be thinner and lighter. Um, but then if you have a window, maybe you have more awareness of what's going on around you on the surface. You know, you can imagine trying to drive a car that has no windows, um, that'd be kind of challenging. Um, and then if you have video systems, there's all there's additional things that could go wrong right. there, but there's a trade off because maybe that's lighter, maybe that's easier. Um, so I don't know that there's one answer. It's, um, and this is true of a lot of the stuff we do is we try to, uh, analyze it as best we can gather all the information we can and look at all the different trade-offs and try to try to find what the right what the right answer is for a specific context uh for a specific mission um emily i don't know if you had anything else um you wanted to add to that yeah you covered covered most of it i was just going to say so in this picture here with the pressurized rover you can kind of see uh the the windows that you know are designed for this one particular concept um, and one of the, the considerations that we were looking at for these windows is you, you can squint a little maybe, um, there's actually a window kind of on the bottom of the very front. So the idea behind that was not only do you have your front windshield windows that you can see through as the astronauts are driving around, you also, since getting into your spacesuit, it's a big process, uh, you know, if you drive up to something that you think you might want to explore, the astronauts can actually get down on um, the floor of the rover and squint out of that bottom window and see if that rock really is worth getting outside to go poke around at. So it's not just looking at, do we want a window or can we get by without it? It's looking at what is the purpose of that window? Is it going to help our pilots be able to land more safely? Is it going to help our crew be able to explore more efficiently? Sure. So, you know, looking at those different options too. Well, thanks for indulging me in that question. But yeah, no, I, that's the kind of thing I think, you know, as a science teacher, former science teacher, I think about that. And I, I hope our students are thinking about that when they're, uh, when they're crafting their designs. Um, so what next? Uh, well, so these are just a few um, you know, links if you want to learn more. NASA is always trying to communicate everything we're doing out to the public. So you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, there's a NASA website uh, with all kinds of information, not just about Artemis, but on all the activities that NASA is doing. So we encourage you to check those out too. All right. Um, we are going to stop there for just a moment because we do uh, have another question. And, and that is going to go into our... Um, uh, our creative piece. So now that we have all this knowledge, uh, we want to know what uh, what can we program our lunar rover to do. And it looks like we've already set us up for some pretty interesting ideas. And to do this uh, project, uh, we're going to bring in our educator, uh, and support coach, and and tinker trainer, uh, Mr. David Lockhart. So welcome, Mr. Lockhart, to Code Lab. Hello. How are you? Oh, we are good. So why don't you uh, share your screen and uh, walk us through this Perfect. project. Um, and Emily and uh, Andrew, as he's building, we are, it's totally okay for us to tell him to stop and pot, you know, and if, if we have some design <laughs> ideas absolutely. that we want to uh, put in there. So. All right. So this project's a really interesting one because this project combines several different factors and things that you can do in the block coding library. I think too, this one has a really good tutorial that kind of leads you through that process of how to build what, what amounts to can even be a game where you're going around the lunar surface and you're going and you're, you're uh, picking up things like rocks and ice with the rover and returning them to um, one of the buildings or one of the labs that's there, the drop zone as it's called in the actor list. 
And really, as you kind of scroll through this tutorial, one of the first things that comes up is actually a really neat part of Tinker that uh, some a lot of people don't even realize it's there. It really goes into like building games and doing all sorts of stuff and kind of goes into kind of a more graphical design interface. And the idea is that when I come down to say the, um, the little awards icon on the left, I can just pull graphics into here rather than, and pull actors in rather than having to go and um, go, kind of sort through the actor list. And I just get here by clicking stage up at the top. And so you can build out a lunar um, habitat, you can build out lunar buildings and all kinds of things to really build out that lunar surface that your rover can work around. As you kind of come a little further, then you start getting into the, some of the actual code. And the first code that the tutorial is gonna ask you to do is it's actually gonna ask you to go and code this crater. And what it's doing is it's asking you to go and add physics blocks to this. Because what we want the, it to do is we don't want the rover as it kind of goes through the project to go into, be able to just kind of roll over the crater easily. And so what it's giving you is it's giving you physics blocks that basically say that it'll make that active. It'll make this crater active physics wise. And that means the rover can't just roll through it. And then if you set if you set static to true, it basically makes it a wall. So as the rover comes up to it, it's going to have to stay on the edge to gather that ice rather than just roll into the crater and kind of fall into the crater and break like it would maybe on the moon or on Mars. Um, as you come through, you can also add more things to it. So as you look at something like the ice, it already gives you the ice and the rocks together but it's fairly simple to just duplicate things in Tinker where I can come in and I can go and I can go down to like the ice actor and I can click the little three dots in the corner and I can just duplicate that ice out. So I can maybe put that ice in a different crater. And the whole idea is that we're going to program the rover to actually go and gather and collect that as we go. As I keep going a little further, it actually will, we're going to, it'll, it'll lead you through a process too, where the whole idea is once you gather that ice and there's some code that's already there to make that gathering of the ice really easy, it's going to actually ask you to plant a flag from where you gathered that ice. And so you can actually come in here and it'll lead you through adding another costume and customizing that flag um, to whatever you want it to be. So you could add things like, um, different logos and you could draw and design things for your flag. And then two, it also asks you to set a win condition. So basically what this is asking me, what this is doing is it's going as it's saying, okay, if I go and um, gather two, um, two of those items, gather two of the sets of ice and I take it over to my collection point, then I'm actually gonna win a game. So you're building a platforming game as you go as well. And really, then it gets into, let's actually code this rover. And really, the rover is a really interesting actor in Tinker. And you can get to it through the actor list. Um, if I go to the actor library, and it's already uploaded in this project, but if you wanted to add it to somewhere else, if I go to the media library, actually, it's not in the media library, my fault. It's actually in the character builder. If I go to the character builder, the rover is here and you can add this rover. And what it does is it actually adds custom coding blocks for the rover to make this really easy for you to code. And all you have to do to get there, because I have the tutorial, is up here in this top right, there's a place where I can close the tutorial and I can get to the coding library. And that's really a general kind of concept with all Tinker projects is that as you close the tutorial out, you can actually get deep into the coding library and you can customize this to whatever you want it to be. And as I look at my list, I have all different types of code, but if I scroll down to the bottom, I have that custom Rover code down here. And notice this makes going and moving the Rover, turning it to different angles, um, actually collecting that ice makes it really easy because all I have to do is I have to say, okay, the rover's turned this way. I wanna go and point the rover in a direction. And I'm gonna point him just for now, I'm gonna point him to 90 degrees. And so now if I press play, that rover is actually just, he's gonna turn to 90 degrees. And I can do things as easy as saying, I'm gonna move the rover by distance and I'm gonna go 
we'll say 500, you can go and this is where you may have to play and adjust and adjust numbers to kind of see what you're doing here. Um, and then if you wanted to go and say, all right, if I get him out to 500, so I'm gonna get him out, he's gonna move out that way. What would be the next code? Is I need to turn him. So I'm actually gonna turn him to zero because that's gonna turn him back. You remember it's on that kind of clockwise. And then I wanna go and move him a distance. I wanna move him a distance. I believe it's a hundred. We may have to play with this a little bit. And then I can actually go and just tap, put in a block that says, I'm gonna pick up that inventory. I'm gonna pick up whatever it is. I'm gonna take the Rover sample and it should pick up that ice. And so as I do it, I may have to adjust the numbers a little bit. It's always going and playing with it a little bit, collecting sample, found ice, and then it plants that flag. And so as you go and you build out your project, the whole idea is can you go and build out that lunar habitat and then build that game where you go and you collect those ice, you collect that lunar sample, and then you return it by using some of this code over here. You could also even customize this and add astronauts and all the other things that come in the actor library too. So let's, uh, let's pause you for just yep. one second. Um, Andrew and Emily, I think I just have one kind of question while students have gotten to this point. Um, collecting ice. Okay, I know we were looking for ice on the moon because, we, you know, what else should we program our lunar rover to do? What, what, what other tasks um, can, we, uh, can we tell students that, uh, that might be beneficial for them, science-y uh, things? Ice is one, definitely. What else? Yeah, so... The ice is for sure one thing because, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're going to the South Pole is we think that there is some ice there. And so that that water, then you can use that for water for your crew. You can also split that ice into its hydrogen and oxygen components, and that gives you your rocket propellant. Um, so you can actually use it to resupply your vehicles. Um, one of the other things, you know, we were talking about looking at the rocks, the lunar soil, the regolith. Um, so collecting rock samples would also be a really great other task for the rover to do. Right. And is there any other benefit to ice other than refueling the rocket? Are, are we, you know, are they making water for, you know, or something? Are they, um, can they use it to like plant you know, for stuff in the greenhouse or, or yeah, um, yeah, it definitely could be to to help for the long term, more sustainable exploration. If you do have a, a greenhouse um, as part of your base camp, um, you know, if you get it purified well enough, it could be used for the astronauts for you know keeping them healthy. Uh, one other thing with going back to the rocks, the like regolith, um, there's some idea that you could actually use that to as part of your construction materials for building um, further infrastructure on the lunar surface as well. Oh, interesting. See, these are things that I'm just so glad we have you for, here for, you know, like building cement or mortar bricks or something, you know, I, I, who knows? Uh, there's, I'm sure a lot of uh, different, um, different thoughts here, but um, <laughs> Dave's already uh, uh, adding uh, um, more movement there. But um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to the question and answer. There's a lot of deep questions. I want to make sure that we have enough time for you uh, uh, to answer a few of these questions because there's some, they're pretty heavy on the science. There we go. Good job, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm... Scanning. Oh, right, we got the second ice. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to go ahead. I the rocks, but I it did the distance a little too late. No All right, problem. I'll let you guys jump over to the questions. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here and get that back over there. But reminder, uh, just that you can, students get an awesome certificate, an awesome NASA certificate. Uh, but I do wanna uh, see more of your questions too. So uh, if you go to this QR code or if you go to go tinker slash code lab Q, uh, if we don't answer your question today, it's always possible we'll answer it tomorrow. So, you know, if, if sometimes they uh, sometimes they bleed over. So that you'll have to watch tomorrow's show and see if we do that. But question number one, uh, and I'm actually going to skip to question three, if you don't mind. I'm going to go out of order here. Uh, this is a question from a seventh grader in New Hampshire at Deerfield Community School. Uh, what does the lunar vehicle use for energy? Who wants to take that? Uh, well, I can I can talk about it a bit 
the the it. vehicle itself um, would have probably some batteries on it, just you know, similar to like an electric car where you can carry um, energy for the day in there. It might have solar panels that can help recharge those batteries, or it might kind of return to a home base and plug in and recharge overnight. Um, you know, from your MS base camp where you could have uh, either larger solar panels, which since you don't have to drive them around on a rover, they can kind of sit there and, and it's a little easier, or you could have a nuclear sure. power source. Interesting. All right, good. That's a great short answer to, to that question. Here's, uh, I'm going to go to question four, and then I'm going to go back to question one. Question four is what new challenges do you face since the last time we went to the moon? Um, what, uh, what do you think? So I think one of the big challenges is with the Apollo program, we were just kind of looking to get there. And, you know, the big the big goal was to get there and get our get our boots on the surface. Here we're looking more towards a more sustainable exploration path. Uh, so, you know, that that means a lot more of different types of vehicles. We're looking for going to different locations. Um, you know, the South Pole provides a little bit more of a challenge to get to. Um, we're using, uh, hopefully going to be staying longer, you know, two weeks, a month, two months as we get better with, with our capabilities. Um, you know, the Apollo missions were staying a couple days uh, to maybe a week or so. So not, not super long. Um, so, you know, Andrew's work with the logistics of how much food do we need to send, you know, all the supplies that you need to send along with the crew to keep them happy and healthy during that time is definitely one of the challenges we're working on. I'm guessing that's probably one of the most expensive hamburgers that uh, any <laughs> anyone uh, could eat on the moon, right? Uh, yeah. I don't even, right? Logistics, you're probably thinking how many, you know, every, every pound, every ounce has a cost, right? Um, so uh, that's fascinating. And one thing I saw earlier in your slide was dust mitigation. So I'm sure in the first time they went there, you know, they were only going to be there for like a couple hours. Now they're going to be there for a while. How do we, you know, what happens when dust gets into things, you know? Yeah. So this is, this is one of the big challenges for the spacesuits in particular, um, as the astronauts are walking around on the lunar surface. Um, and they saw this in some of the later Apollo missions where they do multiple, um, EVAs, extravehicular activity, mm -hmm. um, that after doing it a few times, you get back inside and take off the suit. And their suits, if you've ever seen the pictures, the Apollo suits had these sort of ports on the front where you had hoses that plug in and it goes to the backpack. Um, those got really scratched up from the dust because the dust would just get everywhere. And oh. it's, it's pretty sharp, harsh dust that's kind of grinding the metal and cutting all these seals. So that's that's not good. Oh. Um, and like you said, if we're, we're looking to stay for a long time and do a lot of exploration. So technologies that can help uh, clean surfaces to make sure that there's no dust on them before you reattach something and make sure, you know, it's very, it's, it's very clean to get a good seal without damaging equipment or uh, technologies to help sort of um, electrostatically resist dust. If you can to make, to make equipment that doesn't have dust stick to it uh, while you're outside as much um, to really help it last a lot longer. That is a great answer. I mean, that is exactly, you know, the kind of things uh, we have to think about as we're, uh, you know, and, and these students are going to be doing these projects too. These are, these are big problems. Um, so how long does it take? I'll go to question one, by the way, I didn't give a shout out to uh, third and fourth grade in Billings, Montana, Lockwood intermediate. Great question. Um, question one, how long does it normally take on average to get to a planet uh, this is from fifth grade, uh, Fishers, Indiana, and uh, Hamilton Intermediate Junior High. I'm going to embellish this question just a little bit. Uh, if you want to tell us maybe how long it takes to get to the nearest planet, that's cool. But I'm also curious how it will take, what is the nearest exoplanet we, we, we might be able to visit? Maybe one of you, uh, Emily, or uh, if you want to take that, or uh, has this answer, or one of these answers. Uh, sure. So the big question here is, uh, which planet are you trying to get to? And when do you want to go? Because um, since all the planets rotate around the or orbit around the sun, um, you know, sometimes the planets are a lot closer to each other, depending on what time of year you're going. Um, so for me, since my team is looking at trying to get to Mars, 
the best time to go to Mars when the planets are closest uh, comes around about every 26 months. So about ish every two years is when it's the best time to go to Mars. And the actual trip there will take, you know, depending on which type of propulsion system you're using, um, you know, takes, takes a couple months uh, to maybe a year or so, um, depending on exactly when you leave, when you're trying to come back. Um, now for our crew missions, one you know, the important questions to ask is, you know, we want to bring the crew back. So you're not only looking at just the trip to get there, but you're also looking at the trip to come back. So sometimes it might give you a nice short trip to get there, but depending on how long you're wanting to stay, that could mean your trip back is much, much longer. So oh. right now, like we're looking at round trips for Mars in the two to three year range, depending on again, what, which um, uh, propulsion technology you're using. If you're trying to get to Venus, sometimes we're actually looking at going past Venus on our way to Mars, get a little extra boost from Venus's gravity to help shoot us to Mars a little faster, or shoot us back home to Earth a little faster. Um, so yeah, getting to the other planets is definitely a much longer trip than getting to the moon, which is why we're going back to the moon first <laughs> to get a little bit more practice. Um, to get to the moon with the, the SLS and Orion is gonna take, uh, I think about just, just under a week or so. Um, so, so much, much faster. To, to get to the moon. Wonderful. Yeah, and one of the um, big challenges there, like Emily mentioned, is that all these all these planets are moving. And so, you know, say if you wanted to plan a trip from Chicago to Houston, well, Chicago is always where Chicago is and Houston is always where Houston is relative to each other. And you can just drive right. back and forth um, and, and it's all fine. But imagine if Chicago and Houston were both moving in different directions and kind of orbiting around each other or around, you know, Washington, D.C. or something else. Um, it gets a lot more complicated. And so, like Emily said, some of these missions that we're looking at, you go past Venus on the way to Mars. And, and at first glance, that might not make much sense because Venus is kind of closer to the sun. Mars is further away from the sun. But in orbital mechanics, as all these planets are moving, the path to get to Mars goes kind of goes around the sun. And sometimes you dip in a little closer and do what they call gravity slingshot maneuver to pick mm -hmm. up some momentum from Venus. And then you go out to Mars. And so it's a little, a little non-intuitive, but it's a lot of fun to see the different kind of trajectories that can come out there. And with the moon, like Emily said, the moon is always about a quarter million miles away. Um, so, which is a very, very long way away, but it's always orbiting earth. So you're still relatively close to home. Whereas with something like Mars, when you get there, Earth isn't where it was when you left, and Mars isn't where it was um, when you left either, and everything's all moving. Well, that is awesome. Thank you so much for those very deep answers. Um, I do kind of have to wrap things up. Uh, I have a little kind of a, a few things I want to share with students as we are kind of on our way out. But uh, uh, thanks once again for these just such a great in-depth uh, answers and questions uh, that you've uh, you've given our students. Um, and uh, let's let's take it out here. Uh, just to remind everybody, there's another code lab today, right? There is a Spanish code lab. If you have students that are EL, uh, ELL students or, or dual language uh, students, you can go to this one a little bit later today, 3 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Uh, and we're going to be doing a Spanish code lab, uh, the mission patch with, again, another amazing NASA guest like you folks. Uh, but everything's in Spanish. So they can code alongside their English speaking uh, um, classmates uh, with the same project, the mission patch project. So those two links, pause, rewind, whatever you need to do right there uh, to capture that information. Um, tomorrow, we're going to build a lunar habitat. Uh, and we have another uh, NASA guest that's going to walk us through that. I think, Emily, you might be back, uh, <laughs> uh, which is great. Uh, we're going to build that lunar, lunar habitat, play a little uh, more with Mr. Lockhart, uh, and uh, that is 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and just a couple little things, too, as we on our way out. If you ever miss uh, a Code Lab, um, um, or if you don't want to miss one, you want to subscribe to that using Code Lab Live 21. Uh, if you um, need some additional resources, uh, please go to go tinker slash Artemis links. There's a bunch of great uh, resources there for you, uh, everyone. Uh, and then finally, 
anytime you miss a show, you can always go back and watch it. Just go to go tinker slash NASA live. Uh, but that is going to do it for us today, everybody. Um, want a big thanks to Emily Judd and uh, Andrew Owens, uh, aerospace engineers at NASA for helping us through uh, this uh, awesome conversation. Uh, thank you, everybody. And take care. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.